Okay, right. we are now recording. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is John Morrison, and I am here talking to you on a cool, rainy morning in Maine, USA. And uh, my presentation will be an overview of the guidance that Marsha and myself and some other people have been working on for literally years, I think I can say, um, to, on how to better integrate <laughs> climate change into the open standards. And this is a fairly long presentation. It's some 80 slides, and I would not hold back on your questions. So my suggestion is to jump in, talk to me, use the chat box, whatever is comfortable or your most, is most accessible to you so that you don't have to wait to the end of the, a long presentation. So if you have questions, please please do jump in. I should say that I that we gave this presentation at the CCNet Coaches Rally in Australia approximately a month ago, and all of the the presentations we're giving in this series of webinars were were given at the rally, and so we got relatively positive feedback at the rally, and so now we're giving the same presentations to hopefully a, a larger audience and as we know we're, we're recording this. So again, please jump in with questions. And I think I have to move my mouse around and make that go, there we go. And I'll, we're all familiar with the, the open standards framework, hopefully. So my presentation will explain a proposal for better integrating climate change into the open standards and we're calling it climate smart. I'll give you a little bit of background about what we're doing. We'll do, briefly touch on an example project that will, will thread its way through all of the presentations, the, through the whole series of webinars. I'll give you an overview of the suggested changes, and that's the bulk of the, the presentation tonight. It's really an overview of these changes. A little bit of questions about to you about how we might roll it out. So we'd like to hear your suggestions and just a, one slide about how to provide over or uh, feedback for us. So background, there are literally thousands of conservation practitioners using the open standards on conservation projects, but climate change is pretty challenging. Technically, the direct threat is excess greenhouse gas emissions, but of course, it's much more complicated than that. And we really need to break out the, the various impacts. And that's a large part of our our guidance. Some of the changes are happening gradually, others, some of the most serious impacts are a long way away. And so how do we deal with that? The fact that some things are changing slowly today, but we don't expect the big changes to happen for a long time. How, how do we get our heads around that? And just the, the idea that it's really complicated. So as, as coaches, we face resistance to good conservation planning. Their planning fatigue is a real thing. Project managers' time and resources are squeezed, and sometimes it's difficult to get a week of time of a project team, even for multi-million dollar projects. That's a real phenomenon. There are some people who already think that the open standards is too complicated as it is. So Marsha and Sean and Judy and myself, we all felt a, a lot of pressure to make our suggestions as lean as possible and to provide options. So as complicated as what I may, it may appear to be what I'm gonna to present tonight, believe me, we tried as much as we could to keep it uh, as lean as possible and, and try not to make the changes too complicated. So here are the, the people who've been working on this guidance, Marsha, Judy, Sean Martin, and myself. Marsha, Judy, and myself are, are coaches. We're conservation coaches. Sean is an adaptation specialist. So it was really pretty critical that we had Sean involved in the project. And he helped us reach out to other climate change and adaptation practitioners, um, which was also very important to this whole initiative. We've been developing this these ideas for a while. We presented some of our initial thoughts at the 2015 CCNET Coaches Rally in Spain in 2017, early in 2017, we had a custom workshop that was mostly 
non-open standards people. So people who weren't coaches, but they were climate change experts. And uh, they, we presented our ideas to them and we got excellent feedback from them and, and tried to incorporate as much as, as possible of that feedback into our, the results that you'll see tonight. There is ex some existing open standards climate change guidance. I won't dwell on that. We also looked at lots of other publications, people who had thought long and hard about climate adaptation and how to incorporate it into conservation planning. There was one document in particular, this document, Climate Smart Conservation from National Wildlife Federation and lots of partners. Uh, we found it very helpful and we could open in it. Here's uh, some important themes that we saw in that guidance document. One, including a definition, their definition of climate smart conservation being the intentional and deliberate consideration of climate change and natural resource management realized through adopting forward-looking goals and explicitly linking strategies to key climate impacts and vulnerabilities. Some of the overarching themes that were are part of that document, including acting with intentionality and showing your work, managing for change, not just persistence. So not just deciding no matter what happens, we're going to dig in our heels and we're going to try to keep these ecosystems and species at this site, but being able to realize that change is inevitable in some cases and, and trying to manage for that change. Also to reconsider goals, not just strategy. So in the face of climate change, it may be that you need to into our existing conservation work. So those are some of the things that we really liked about that National Wildlife Federation Climate Smart document. So our working group philosophy was that there's a lot of rhetoric in the climate change community about integrating climate change into all conservation. We agree with that into development planning. However, planning and funding in particular is generally specific to climate adaptation. There are lots of climate adaptation plans. There's climate adaptation funding that's not necessarily accessible to regular conservation projects that would like to better incorporate climate change and to do adaptation, to, but to make it part of the, the larger package. And we believe that treating it separately perpetuates the lack of integration that the climate change community decries. So we're hoping that climate smart conservation will become just that, that doing conservation in a way that considers climate changes becomes the normal way of, of doing business. And there's not adaptation planning and the other climate or conservation planning and you try to merge them, but they're, they're actually merged from the beginning in a really truly integrated way. So also part of our philosophy is that we under, need to understand climate change effects on people. We need to understand the effects on the key species and ecosystems we're trying to conserve. And we also need to understand people's reactions because those reactions may in fact be worse than the direct impacts on the species and ecosystems. So we need to try to anticipate how people will react to these climate impacts and how those reactions will in turn affect the ecosystems and species that we work with. Also due to the uncertainty around climate modeling, which are very useful, we need to use some scenarios to bound our uncertainty. So here is a quick overview of the open standards, the way we've traditionally presented it. So the first step is typically to understand what you want to conserve. Those are the conservation targets. Depending on the kind of project you're working with, you also might want to understand how eco ecosystem services are derived from those conservation targets and how human well-being is attached, uh, related to those conservation targets and ecosystem services. We next want to understand the current state of those conservation targets and what our future desired state is. What are our future goals for the ecosystems and species we're working with? We identify and rate the threats to understand which threats are most critical. We do a situation analysis and build a conceptual model to try to understand in one picture what all of the direct threats and driving factors are related to the conservation targets and human well-being. We use that conceptual model to identify strategies 
then we choose strategies in one way or another and we develop detailed logic chains or theories of change or results chains to show the logic of how those strategies will work and we implement the strategies monitoring as we go and make adjustments in an adaptive management framework so again this is the traditional way we've taught and used the open standards and the next slide will just give you i'm not expecting you to uh, follow it because it's a little bit messy but i just want to give you an impression of how deeply we thought about what changes might be needed if we really want to fully integrate climate change and so I'll just give you a taste of the amount of change we're, we're talking about. And I'll show you a cleaner version of this in the next slide. But you, you can see all the markups that we've got in this slide. So it, it just represents the idea that we, we, we thought about every step of the, the process and how we might want to be a little bit more rigorous. So here is a one slide overview of our new proposed framework. And I will go into all of these steps in, in detail, but I want to give you the overview first. So the first step is to define the scope, identify the conservation target, and well, if that's appropriate. This is pretty much the same as it's always been. The next step is to understand the current state of ecosystems, but not the future goals for those ecosystems and species yet. So we want to understand how, what's the status of our conservation targets, but not thinking too far ahead because we don't have a bit good enough understanding in this process of what the climate impacts are gonna be yet. Next step would be to identify the conventional threats and add these to a conceptual model. So the conventional threats being the non-climate threats. The next step, and this is the, probably the, the biggest set of changes that we're proposing, is to develop a minimum of two climate scenarios for the site and use those to identify climate changes, including the ecological impacts, the direct ecological impacts of those climate changes, the impacts to humans of those climate changes, and then those human reaction impacts that I mentioned before. And to our understanding, these the impacts, the ecological impacts, the human impacts, and the human reaction impacts represents a vulnerability assessment and not just a general vulnerability assessment that is easy to find all over the world, but a specific vulnerability assessment specific to the conservation targets related to your project. The next step is to combine the conventional threats, the non-climate conceptual scenarios, and it might be more than one conceptual model. We'll talk about that. Then to rate the conventional threats and the climate impacts using slightly different rating systems that I'll also talk about. Then a, a pause step. So step number seven is to take a deep breath, look back now that we have a better understanding of what the climate impacts are and the, the range of potential climate impacts to take a step back and look at our ecosystems and species of conservation targets and try to better understand the achievable states for those ecosystems and species and potentially even decide to give up on an ecosystem or species because it's at the edge of its range or it just doesn't seem tenable to uh, try to hold on to those but basically it's a step to go back to the, the beginning and revisit your conservation targets and your and see what your achievable goals might be given your new understanding of climate the next step is to identify climate smart or non-maladaptive -mal strategies based on the general model, so on your conceptual model. Then develop detailed results chains showing how the strategies would work, even in the face of climate change. And I'll talk about more, more about what that means. Then again, implement the strategies, monitoring both the strategies and climate, and make adjustments. So I showed you the, I'll go back quickly and this is the, uh, the basic model, and now it's a little more complicated with all of these suggested changes. And again, it's mostly about the scenarios, the scenario planning, which we think is a, an important step. So it's this step four, which is really the, the big change. And I would suggest that the other changes are, are relatively minor. I'd also say that if it does seem a bit complicated, it's not absolutely necessary that every project 
use this methodology. So if a project is going to be long term or if it's a program that's long term and really interested in the long term conservation of a site or a species, then I would suggest that this method might be appropriate. Appropriate. If it's a really short term project that's only for a year or two or isn't really site based and isn't so uh, focused on conservation targets but has another intermediate objective, then you might want not want to use this this method. So just bear that in mind that we're not proposing that every project use this uh, method. And of course, just like all parts of the open standards, you don't have to use the whole thing. You can start anywhere. You don't have to start at the beginning. You can use the parts that are most relevant to you. But I'm going to present so, sort of from, from scratch how you would approach things in our proposed guidance. Any questions? I'm going to do each one of those, these steps. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. So first step, define the scope, conservation targets, if it's relevant, also the ecosystem services and human well-being. This is not really any, represent any change from previous practice. Here's the, the example project that will be presented in the, this presentation just a little bit and some of the other presentations as, as well. It's the San Francisco Bay and Central California, it's a, a set of wildlife refuges ar around the bay. And so some of the example slides you'll see will have come from this particular example project. So it's the San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge Complex. So here are some of the targets in that complex. Riverine sand dunes, vernal pool grasslands, Pajaro Valley watershed, coastal sand dunes, tidal marsh and water birds estuarine island ecosystems as well. Marine island ecosystems. So this is a set of targets that we'll use in the example. Here's a, the beginning of a conceptual model. You can see all the targets that I just mentioned here. Some ecosystem services that are derived from those conservation targets and some human well-being targets as well. It's not so important to look at all of those details, but just to familiarize you with the example we'll be using. So the next step, understand the current state of ecosystems, but not future goals yet. So that's essentially just viability analysis, but just not looking at the, the future desired state. Next step is to identify the conventional threats and add those to conceptual models. So that's really no different than standard practice. Then we come to step number four, where we develop a minimum of two, is our recommendation, climate scenarios for the site and use those to identify climate changes and the ecological human and human reaction impacts. So this is a, a new step. And so I'm gonna take a detour for a while. So remember where we are in the overview of the our whole process. I'm gonna take a detour and, and talk about this climate scenario stuff for a while because it really is the heart of our the changes that we're suggesting. So some sur sources of uncertainty related to climate change. So one is that we don't quite understand the trajectory of greenhouse gas emissions for the entire planet or any particular region. We don't know how societies will develop in the future and how much greenhouse gas emissions they'll continue to put into the atmosphere. You understand reduction of the climate exposure factors. In other words, depending on how much greenhouse gas emission gets put into the atmosphere in any particular place, we don't necessarily have an idea whether or not the temperature will get a bit warmer, whether it will get really hot, whether precipitation will even increase or decrease. In some places, it's just not clear what the signal is. So we don't understand how much emissions will happen. We don't understand how the climate will react to those emissions. There's, of course, stochasticity and a certain amount of randomness associated with things like extreme storms. We don't understand the response of ecosystems and species to the changes that we don't quite understand. We don't necessarily understand how people will react when these un understood changes occur and whether or not this will involve maladaptation. In other words, will humans actually make things worse depending on what the changes are? And we don't understand the effectiveness of policies and management actions. 
And of course, we don't understand the accuracy of the range of climate models. There are a lot of climate models out there, and we don't know which one is the most accurate. So res possible responses to this uncertainty, one response would be to focus on the better understood problem, parts of the problem. We could wait for more certainty before we take any action. We can wait 20 or 30 years and see what's going to happen before we do anything. We can pretend as though there is no uncertainty, or our recommendation is that we understand and, and work with that uncertainty. And the way we can do that, one way to do that, is to use scenario planning, which is a decision support method that can help address uncertainties in natural resource management, including those associated with climate change. Scenario planning has a long history of use in military and in business. It's particularly applicable to situations with high uncertainty, complexity and impact, and low controllability. It's basically a tool for thinking broadly and imagining a future that could be very different from the past or the present, which is the situation that we find ourselves in. So here's a slide that shows uh, four different global circulation models and what they predict or what those projections are for those models for temperature across the United States. So same inputs, but these four models give clearly four different outputs in terms of temperature. Here are four different outputs in terms of what precipitation changes might happen. So it just gives you an idea of the range of variability um, between models. No one knows which one of these models is, is going to be correct. Here's another example where here's the current array of forest types in the upper Midwest of the United States. Here's what lower emissions might show. Here's what higher emissions might show. And this is just for one particular model. So if you use lots of different models, you're going to get a lot of uncertainty about what's really going to happen. So why would we use scenario planning? We need to consider multiple future, potential futures to ask how will climate change affect our conservation targets? Which species and ecosystems are going to be most vulnerable? How will species ranges shift potentially? How will ecosystem composition change as species move latitudinally and altitudinally? Because a lot of these ecosystems are probably going to break apart. Species are going to act independently, and there are going to be new combinations of, of ecosystems. So here is a one diagram that shows level of control across along this axis and level of uncertainty here. So we've got low and low level of uncertainty, high level of uncertainty, low level of control, high level of control. Scenario planning is appropriate for situations where you've got high uncertainty and a low level of control, which is exactly the situation we find ourselves in with climate change. We don't know what's going to happen, so uncertainty is high, and we can't control it anymore. The emissions are in the atmosphere. It's going to happen. So it's the worst possible situation to be in. The best possible situation is up here where you've got a high level of control and a low level of uncertainty. This is where we can plan for well for our future. But unfortunately, we find ourselves in the worst place here. And scenario planning is a, is a tool for dealing with that situation. So here's an example. So this I showed you one quadrant. It's a little bit confusing. This is one quadrant met model where it's level of uncertainty and this is level of control. This is a completely different quadrant where the axes are less precipitation versus more precipitation in the natural warming versus extreme heat waves. So this is a, a relatively common uh, situation where the, some models in a particular place are saying there's going to be less precipitation. Some of the climate models are saying there's going to be more precipitation. We don't know which is correct. Some of the models are saying there's going to be gradual warming. Other models are saying they're going to be extreme heat waves. Just using these two uh, climate variables, we're able to construct this quadrant where there are four possibilities. So just two variables, you get four scenarios. And this is the recommended, our recommended approach to scenario planning. There are other possible ways to do it, but this we think is the most straightforward way to do it. Um, and I'll go into it a little bit. And you typically, you, you give these scenarios names. So in this quadrant, it's going to be much hotter and wetter. And we call that a wet, hot mess. In this scenario, it's slight warming and wetter. We'll give it a name like Tropicana. In this scenario, it's 
slight warming and drier based on these two variables. We'll call that Hotel California. In this scenario, much hotter and drier, we call that dry roasted based on the, the two variables we have. So this is an example of the kind of scenario planning we're talking about. John. Yes. Hi, Anita. Yeah, this is Anita. Hello. I, I'm thinking in, in Atlantic forests, we say that probably the wet season is going to be wetter and the dry season is going to be drier. Okay. And then in this case, where would I go? You could have, let's see, I have to think about that one a little bit, but uh, it might be even more complicated than that. Uh, I could imagine that you could have multiple scenarios. You could even have two quadrant models like this, mm -hmm. where one is for the, the dry season and one is for the wet season. And you could look okay. at a range of climate models for both the, the wet season independently and then and the dry season independently and uh, see what how much uncertainty there is. Mm -hmm. That's what we're okay. really asking. The question we're asking is how much uncertainty is there for, say, just the dry season? And how much uncertainty is there for just the wet season. Now, if they all the models agree and they say that the, the wet season will get wetter and the dry season will get drier, that simplifies your, your planning a little bit. Doesn't necessarily make the situation any better, but uh, at least simplifies the planning. So that's what we're really asking. We're asking the question for any particular season, what are the models telling us? Are they all in the same direction? And maybe for your situation in Atlantic Forest, they are, or is there a lot of variability? Does okay, that help? Thank you. Yes, very. Uh -huh. Thank you. So I'm still in the scenario planning. So I'm going to go through some steps that we would recommend and that actually how to build uh, a quadrant scenario model like this one. So we went on a detour. We were still in step four about scenario planning and we're going to dive a little bit deeper uh, on that detour. So one thing to do when you're trying thinking about doing scenario planning is to build a, a local seasonal calendar. So local obviously can depend. You might have a very small site or it might be about a region, but one tool to use with a local community or any group of stakeholders is try to get your head around what current climate is and how ecosystems and species are related to the, the seasons and, and climate, how human outdoor occupations are related to the seasons and climate and uh, how even human uh, activities like festivals and things like that are related to seasons and climate. So if you see this axis right here is just January, February, it's the months of the year. And these post-its represent warm season starting, ra rainy season starting, drought sometimes occurring in the month of July, et cetera. So this was an effort to under try to understand how climate typically changes across the year these green post-its represent ecological happenings, migrations, uh, breeding, feeding, insect outbreaks, phenology of various kinds across the year. These pink ones are about human activities, outdoor activities, and some of the orange post-its represent uh, festivals and things like that, so human-related things. And this is an easy tool to use to start to get your head around how climate interacts with both the, the natural world and the human world in any particular place. So just a, it's an easy use tool. So that's the first step, if you don't already have that understanding. Then the idea is to use some different RCPs or representative concentration pathways and GCMs, I'm throwing, I know I'm throwing some acronyms at you, or global circulation models to identify important variables. This is not, my talk is not really that technical. The idea here is that basically IPCC has come up with some recommended standardized emission scenarios, this being the most aggressive one, the worst case scenario, the 8.5 and the 6 being a little bit less aggressive. The 2.6 is probably not realistic. We're probably going to go, things are going to be much worse than this. But the idea is that there are some representative possible potential future emission scenarios. And when you combine that, you can start to understand what the models are telling us about what the potential future 
might be. So don't pay much attention to the technical elements of this. I mean, here, here we are, this is time. We're about 2018 right here. And the most aggressive representative concentration pathways showing emission scenario like this, and these are somewhat less aggressive ones. And so there's, there's pluses and minuses to which ones you use, and, and uh, we can talk about those at length. So, but the idea is that there are some different emission scenarios and you want to combine those with a, a range of global circulation models. And it's pretty easy to get your hands on 10 or, or 20 models, either with help from a local university, a local agency, climate people on the staff of your organizations, or there's a tool called Climate Wizard that the Nature Conservancy and other aid institutions on the web which use and use a range of global circulation models that you can use and you can play around with it. We did a whole session about this at the coaches rally in, in Australia a month ago and uh, we were working with people to try to understand how this tool works and it's a pretty easy to use tool to look at the range of outputs from those models. So in any case we want to understand the outputs of those models and we want to understand which climate variables have a lot of uncertainty what it is, which scenario you use. Here are some of the variables that might have uncertainty. Um, temperature in various ways of measuring temperature, whether it's daily or weekly or monthly or annual. Precipitation, again, there's lots of ways to, to measure precipitation. Sea level rise, ocean acidification, the amount of snow cover you get and how long it lingers. Uh, the amount and severity of extreme temperature events or precipitation events, other extreme storms, wind events, hurricanes, the frequency and magnitudes to, or magnitures, whatever that means, of droughts. I've bolded temperature and precipitation because those are the typical variables that most people are concerned about. But any of these variables or any other variables are perfectly fair game if it makes sense for your planning. And it doesn't have to be limited to climate variables. So one of the climate variables in your scenario planning might be about precipitation. Another of the variables might be whether or not in the future political environment, uh, the government takes a, a green economy planning framework in mind, or it's just gonna, versus being just business as usual. So there are all sorts of socioeconomic variables that you could also consider using. However, you have to remember that the more variables you use, the more complicated your planning is going to get because you're going to start to, the scenarios are going to start to multiply. Okay, so say you choose two key variables. In this case, we've got less precipitation, more precipitation. So some of the models in our example are saying it's going to, there's going to be less precipitation. Some of the models are saying there's going to be more precipitation. This is not an uncommon uh, situation to face. And again, some of the models say gradual warming, some of the models say extreme heat waves. So here are the two variables. We work with those variables, as in the example I presented earlier, to, to develop a quadrant scenario model. And we so here are four scenarios that we could work with, okay, just using those two climate variables to develop these. So you could work with all four scenarios. That is a ton of work uh, to play out the potential impacts, the ecological impacts, the human impacts, the human reaction impacts of all four of those scenarios, of all four of these scenarios in this example. That's a ton of work. So what are the alternatives? You could choose one least change scenario and one other simply different scenario in the US National Park System does some, something similar to that. You could select the scenarios that your team believes would have the greatest impact on your conservation targets based on your thinking. You could select simply two scenarios that are very different. In any case, we're, we're suggesting that selecting at least two scenarios will be helpful to try to get your, your head around what the changes are. So maybe they're the, the two most that have the most impact maybe the two the most different as far as you can tell, but at least choose two scenarios based on the outputs of the, the models. So here's back to our example. Maybe you choose 
these two models because they seem to be the, the most severe and they're the, maybe the most different as well. But that's just an example. So again, I'm still in the scenario planning uh, phase. I'm, I'm still on the detour. So once you've selected a couple scenarios for each scenario independently, now you want to try to get your handle on, okay, what are the impacts? Let's say it's just this scenario. What are the ecological impacts? What are the human impacts? What are the human reaction impacts for this scenario? You could use something we call ecological drawings where you have all of your targets. It's hard to see in this diagram, but all of the conservation targets are here. The, the montane forest, the alpine areas, the riparian system, et, et cetera, et cetera. The freshwater habitats are all drawn in this map as well as human activities on the landscape. And we can talk about, okay, here's a potential impact of that. The glaciers are melting. We're getting new pests coming in. There's more grassland. There's more diseases coming in, et cetera, et cetera. So this is just for one scenario to try to get your head around it using an ecological drawing tool. It doesn't have to be this, but this is a nice tool to use with, with stakeholders. Then you, of course, you wanna capture it in some sort of a table. This is a, a rough drawing trying to capture the same impacts from this drawing into a table, and of course you can clean it up and we have the data sheet. And again, the direct ecological impacts, the human impacts, and the human reaction impacts. And that's what these three columns actually represent in this table, even though it's not necessarily clear. So then you wanna put those impacts back into your diagram. The same scenario is just an example of some of the impacts. For example, in the dry roasted scenario, we'd get more frequent forest fires. The, some of the rivers are becoming ephemeral. They're not running all through the year. And in terms of a human reaction impact, you'd have decreased human population because people would literally move out of the area because it just wouldn't be a, a friendly environment for people to live. And so people would actually be, be leaving versus this scenario down here where we believe that there'd be a, an increased human population from the slight warming and, and wetter conditions. So this is actually better, better agricultural yields, grasslands are turning to forest, people are moving into the area. So the, the changes we'd expect from this scenario would be much different than the changes we'd expect from this scenario. And so the idea is, to, and this is just a, a shorthand of some of the changes. The Another diagram that I could, possibly show you would have 20 different impacts listed for each one of these scenarios. All right, so that was my detour. I was just, for the last 15 slides or so, I was just talking about the scenario planning. And I, I didn't tell you really how to develop those scenarios very much. I didn't talk about the climate wizard tool and how you choose all of the global circulation models that you would need to choose to, and what variables are the best variables. There's a whole other uh, whole other presentation about actually how to do that, but I hope it gives you a taste of why we would do scenario planning and what it would actually look like. So assuming that we did the scenario planning, we would want to next combine the conventional threats, the non-climate threats, along with the climate threats in conceptual model in the conceptual model for the scenarios. And again, it may require more than one model depending on how complicated and how different the impacts we find are from the various scenarios. So there are some new elements to this, although it's not entirely new. So here's some diagrams. So here are the conservation targets. Here are stresses resulted, resulting from some conventional threats, disease, boat groundings, and anchor damage in a marine environment. Here are some other conventional threats that are all related. Here are some stresses. Here are some stresses related to climate change. We actually recommend that using a simple threat rating, which I'll talk about in a, in a bit, that we change those stresses and think about them as actual threats. So we're going to call these climate stresses. Technically, this is the direct threat, and these would be stresses, but we're saying that these climate stresses, we'll treat them as if they're direct threats. So things like ocean acidification, sea level rise, increase in sea surface temperature, and increased storms, we would treat as 
as actual direct threats for the just for the purposes of our our planning even though that's not technically correct so here's another diagram showing those same impacts and treating the climate stresses as direct threats and so here's the full conceptual model with the climate impacts highlighted okay so the idea is to show the relationships the direct impacts of climate to the conservation targets as well as the synergistic impacts where climate impacts are acting synergistically with conventional threats on the conservation targets again you might need more than one conceptual model diagram depending on how complicated your different scenarios are if you have very different scenarios you might consider having two conceptual models and and we don't have a lot of experience with that so we think that uh, we'll have to learn how what the best practice is in terms of whether or not you try to stuff it all into one conceptual model or you, you need to have more than one. So here's another example. In this example, you can see that the uh, this team has climate change, sea level rise longer term and climate change, sea level rise near term. So for two different time horizons, and they can raise these threats independently versus the long term because we anticipate that the longer term impacts for virtually every climate change uh, impact is going to be worse than the, the near term. So then once we combine these in the conceptual model then we would rate the threats both the conventional threats and the climate threats using a slightly different rating system. There's, there's some new elements to this. So two options. I'll talk about the stress-based threat rating first, actually. I'll talk about option B first. So I'm not sure how many of you have used the stress-based threat rating for conventional threats in the past. It's, it's really helpful when you at a site when you don't really understand why the target is not faring very well because it helps you tease out what's really going on, what are the stresses, and think about what the various combinations of sources of stress or direct threats are that are causing those causing the target not to do very well. It's a little bit more complicated. It takes a little bit more time, but Marathi can accommodate the stress-based rate, stress based threat rating. And uh, it was Nature Conservancy practice for many years to use the, the stress-based threat rating. Most people these days use simple threat rating. And that's probably our preferred option, just because it is simpler. Um, to use the, the simple threat rating, and I'll do have some more explanation of, of that. Assuming you're using the simple threat rating, here's the column for conventional threats, so things like unsustainable fishing, the threats we've always dealt with, and here is a column representing the climate threat, so things like temperature changes, precipitation changes, ocean acidification. So typically, the time frame for conventional threats has been the next 10 years. That's standard practice to say, okay, this combination of direct threat and conservation target, what is the scope, severity, and irreversibility going to be over the next 10 years? For climate threats, it's probably appropriate to have two time frames. So you could use the next 10 years, plus you could have a longer term frame, time frame, or you could just use a longer term time frame. It's totally up to you. But the it's important to think about it at least. What kind of time frames do we do we want to use as a planning team? In terms of the criteria, scope, severity, and irreversibility are, are standard practice for conventional threats. We're suggesting that for climate threats, that the most relevant criteria for rating a climate threat is scope, which is the same, severity, which is the same, and instead of irreversibility, feasibility of management. And I'll explain that. So for every target threat combination, score the threat by three criteria, scope, severity, and feasibility of management to help the target adapt to, to climate change rather than irreversibility. So here's what Marathi would look like. And we've actually talked to the Marathi folks, and they're amenable to, to making a change like this if the feedback continues to be positive that this is the way to go. So scope would be the same. Proportion of the target expected to be affected by the threat over either the near term or this could also be the long term. So we'd have an option. And we, so we'd be rating it for near term 
and long term. So this, these criteria are pretty much the same. The threat is likely to be pervasive in its scope affecting the target across all or most of its occurrence population. That's a very high scope rating. So the only change there would be whether or not you're talking about near term or longer term for climate threats. There are some, uh, you, you think that scope would always be very high for climate impacts because of course the climate is changing over uh, huge scales. And typically it is very high, but we've noted some cases where it might not be very high. So for example, sea level rise won't affect all of a water bird species breeding habitat or all of an island target. It'll just affect the shoreline, just the near shore environment. And if a particular species can nest further up in an island or further away from the shoreline, then the scope isn't actually gonna be very high for that particular species. Also, if a significant portion of an ecosystem target is, has a climate refuge, yeah. so a portion of a stream, for example, that is less affected by temperature increases because there's a spring, a cold spring. So the scope won't be complete. It won't be exhaustive or very high. It may be, depending on how big that climate refuge is, it could be high or, or, even, or even medium. And if a part of a species target life history is outside of the project scope, for example, migrating cranes, Maybe the, the wintering habitat of those migrating cranes won't be nearly as affected by that particular climate change or is completely different in its wintering habitat. So don't always assume that the scope will be very high, although it, it often is, but at least give some thought to what the scope really is for a particular climate threat and that particular climate threat target combination. Okay, so that's scope. Severity, there's really no change except for, again, the, the time frame, whether it's near term or longer term. And then here's this new criteria that we've been talking about, feasibility of management to help the target adapt to climate change. In other words, the degree to which the effects of a climate threat on a target can be mitigated within a given time period, in the near term or long term, and the feasibility, whether that's technical or otherwise, of mitigation measures. So. The idea was that irreversibility, because these climate changes are locked in for a couple of centuries at least, it didn't make much sense to use irreversibility. So we're suggesting that instead of reversibility, we have this management feasibility. So instead of very high irreversibility, we would say, okay, very low management feasibility. In other words, it is very unlikely that there are management strategies that can help me within the scope near term or long term or that mitigation measures to offset the climate stress have very low feasibility it requires a significant amount of resources beyond what is currently available and requires actions by multiple partners is politically challenging or technically challenging i won't read all of the other you know, the high medium and low but i hope you get the idea that instead of very high irreversibility high irreversibility which is sort of the negative we were saying, okay, that actually equates to very low management feasibility, that we're not able to manage that particular threat target combination very well. And we think that would be a more meaningful way to rate climate threats in addition to scope and irreversibility. And these are the other, other uh, criteria, but I'm not gonna read them. So I'm gonna keep going. All right, so that's that was step six, rating the threat as we are rating the climate impacts using slightly different rating systems, scope, severity, and management feasibility. Then here we come to the, the pause step, step seven, where we revisit the ecosystems and species and understand their achievable states, thinking about whether or not it makes sense to try to hold on to our targets and ecosystems or whether they'll probably leave the area or at least in terms of what our future desired goals are, now that we understand both the conventional threats, the climate threats, and the combined conventional climate threat impacts in our conceptual model, we feel like at this point, we're in a much better place to try to come up with goals, future goals for our ecosystems and species. So that's why we're holding off, rather than doing it early on like we used to here, we're saying, now that we have this better understanding, let's try to, figure out our achievable states or achievable goals at this point. And that's a new step. 
All right, so yeah, this is just a slide to illustrate that, okay, now we can start, start to talk about what our future desired status is because we have a much better idea of what the future might be like. At this point, we would identify climate smart, hopefully not maladaptive strategies on our conceptual model. So we brainstorm all sorts of strategies right on top of the conceptual model, hopefully not using not to maladaptive strategies. And now that we understand what the range of potential scenarios are using our scenario planning. So we've thought about getting hotter with less precipitation. We've also, also thought about getting hotter with more precipitation. So we've tried to bound the uncertainty. Now we can ask the question, okay, here's some, a potential strategy. Will it work in both of the scenarios that we've looked at? Will it work in the hotter and drier? Will it also work in the hotter and wetter? And if it doesn't work in one of those scenarios, then that's a red flag because that's potentially a maladaptive strategy. Since we don't know which scenario is going to come to, come to pass, that's a, a red flag. And so hopefully we can restrict ourselves to those strategies that will work in either one of the scenarios. That's the idea, to just be aware that, huh, if some strategies don't work in all of our scenarios, then it's potentially, potentially true that that might be a maladaptive strategy. And so we use the scenarios as a filter. All right, so we've thought about a categorization for strategies and uh, related to climate. And here is our draft suggested categorization of climate smart strategies. One is a conventional threat abatement strategy. The same kinds of strategies that we've always used for conventional threats, something like promoting water conservation to try to address this threat of diversion of, of water from municipal use out of a out of a river system. So this is the, so the same kinds of things we've always done, not necessarily any relation to climate there. Another category of strategy we've got is viability enhancement. So ju just like we've typically used in the past, restoring a conservation target trying to make the, the conservation targets as viable as possible so that they would, can withstand the climate changes that are likely to come. The next category is an adaptation strategy. So this is more of a, a strictly adaptation strategy, such as a strategy to create artificial habitats or conditions. So for example, storing water in tanks to ensure that ecological flows happen during the dry season. This is a very artificial uh, strategy, but it might be required in, in a particular case. And then strategy category 3B, strategies to prevent human maladaptation. So for example, capturing and storing rainwater in lower watershed for human use during the dry season so that people won't uh, install more dams and ruin the ecological connectivity in the river system. So this is our proposed uh, categorization of strategies. It's not necessary that we don't think that everyone uses this categorization, but we were forced in our thinking to, to come up with a, a categorization that worked for us that seemed to encompass all of the potential strategies that you would use and that we think are, are climate smart. So, and we're very open to hearing feedback about this categorization, whether it works or not. So, once we've selected the strategies, we'll come from uh, the idea is to, again, as usual, develop a logic chain, a results chain, to show how the strategies will work, even in the face of climate change. And we're considering this to be a modified step. And the modifications are that we would include the actual climate impacts in our results chain. So here's a, a normal results chain but we're leaving these climate stresses in the results chains to represent the, the idea that, yes, we think our strategy is going to work. However, we think it's gonna work even in the face of these climate stresses that are not going away. So in general, with a conventional threat, we're trying to reduce the conventional threat, but with a lot of these climate impacts, they're gonna be sticking around. So it's an acknowledgement, basically, that the climate impacts will still be around. And we're hoping that our strategy will still be in the face. So we're including the stress reduction KEA enhancement results 
but we're keeping the, the climate threats there since we can't get rid of them. And we're also saying that monitoring and evaluation and adaptive management are particularly important due to the, due to the uncertainty related to climate change. So having that monitoring activity in there so that we can be more adaptive is also going to be more important in the future. So this almost the penultimate step is to implement your strategies, monitoring the strategies and climate, as I showed in the previous slide. So this is pretty similar, but we want to monitor the climate change impacts as well in some cases, and then make adjustments, which is basically the same thing as before. So that is my run through of the whole process. I know I went fast. I know it's a lot to absorb. Um, so we wonder, do you have questions? I can, we have some time to go back and, and answer your specific questions about any of the things I just presented. And we have questions for you. What's the best way to roll this out? Are these webinars sufficient? We do intend to have written guidance supporting uh, th these ideas in addition to the, to the PowerPoints. And for the longer term, if you have feedback that you know you want to think about or you want to look at the these presentations in the fullness of time and give us feedback we'd love to hear about it so the floor is open for for questions hopefully not everyone's muted have we lost you guys uh, this is Diane grand forest can you hear me Yeah, um, I, I don't have a specific question. It's a lot to take in, but um, it makes a lot of intuitive sense. I have had the Climate Smart Conservation class through NCTC. And um, yeah, I, th I, I really like, because I'm working on a process right now. We've just started and I've really been struggling. I'm up in Alaska. Yeah. So it's... Um, you know, it's knocking on the door, but again, you know, it's one of those things that's out of ways and nobody's quite sure what's going to happen. And, um, you know, even though I had the Climate Smart Conservation, I like how you brought the two together. All right. Well, we appreciate the positive encouragement. Well, we'd be able to, um, we have access to this presentation. Besides yes. The, uh, so, um, so Diane, I don't, I don't know if you received the email that I sent out to the Conservation Coaches Network, or if you heard about these webinars through WWF. Um, but yes, there's a site. Um, I can just send you an email afterwards with, um, with the link. But there's a site where we've put all of the materials. Um, that we prepared for the Conservation Coaches Network rally that include um, PowerPoints as well as handouts for each one of the sessions. So I can I can send that to you. Awesome. Marcia, this is Alexander and Australia. If you could send it to me as well, that'd be great. And a great presentation, John was fantastic. Thank you. And John, do you still have time? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm thinking, well, I can think about uh, the reality that I'm facing now that it's in Atlantic Forest. And of course, there's a lot of uncertainty, but there are some things that we know. Uh, we know, for example, the areas that are going to be more vulnerable. So it's more about the, the location of uh, the vulnerable areas for climate change. And also we know very good strategies that basically creation of protect areas, increase of vi uh, viability with restoration by increasing the connectivity of the landscape. So we kind of already have the answers, even though we don't really know what is going to happen. We know where it's going to happen and what we should we be doing. So should we think about when you, um, we are moving ahead with these recommendations that sometimes you don't really need to go through all these because the strategy that you know is going to work either way? Well, potentially what you're saying, I could see that being the case. And the one caution I would have would be when you say you know what's going to happen, my just going through this process, mm -hmm. Thinking about this as much as I have, I've got a better understanding of, of how uncertain 
the future can be in, in some places. So my caution to you would be, when you say you know, is that based on what? On changes that have already been occurring and it's very clear that it's going in that direction? On modeling, and if so, was it one model? Was it the range of models? Because I've just seen that the models can potentially give you different answers and mm -hmm. we don't know necessarily which one of those answers is right. So you could easily spend a couple hours using Climate Wizard, and there's about 10 models in Climate Wizard mm -hmm. for a particular area of the Atlantic Forest and you know, put the, the, the variables that you're most interested in in the climate wizard and see if all the models agree if they all agree like you're saying then you're probably going in the right direction but it, it I whether all those models agree actually what i mean is more about we know where the the changes are going to happen so the the vulnerable places for climate change well i guess I, it's the same thing okay these models have uh, spatial elements to them as well and so see mm -hmm. if the models are all agreeing in terms of the areas that are most vulnerable to change or mm -hmm. where the changes are most severe okay mm -hmm. that would be my caution yeah and i'm going to jump in just to say that i i think that there's a difference between sites where um you you know that things are going to change in a certain direction, but you don't know how much. Like you know that sea level rise is going to increase, but you don't know how much it's going to increase. Um, you know whether it increases by you know six inches or ten inches. You know may not drastically change your management actions. I think that what more problematic and where the scenario planning is more useful is where um, things could potentially go in one of two opposite directions like it could get drier or it could get wetter you know, then, even if they're going the same direction you might want to see what the spread is in terms of what the model yeah yeah and the seasonality of some changes is, is also very interesting to see in, in those yeah. models um, so Estuardo has um, a comment, a couple of comments. He says, maybe I came late, but I'd like to know how was the process of doing this new version of the methodology? What were the shortcomings that you find in the previous one? Um, and yeah, actually that, it's a, that same comment. It just, for some reason, it came through three times. Okay. Why would you do it? Why would you go through? Yeah, why would you do? Why would you go through all of this? Because it really looks like a bunch of additional work. Excellent. Right. <laughs> well, basically, as the the idea is that uh, in some of the vulnerability assessments that are are out there, they've only used one model. So people are are planning based on the output from from one model, and because there's a an extreme in some cases in extreme range of variability in what the models are telling us and we don't know again which one is correct and uh, get an idea much telling us the same thing that's important to know and I think we can have, have more confidence and uh, and act accordingly however because it is so common that the models disagree uh, we think it's important to to take a time out do the scenario planning, see if the models agree for at least a couple of scenarios, if all of your strategies really are appropriate given those different scenarios. That's my pitch for why you would put the extra work in. And again, Any I guess other? I would say that if you've got a really short-term project, like a two-year project, or it's the kind of thematic project that's about increasing management effectiveness or um, increasing capacity or something like that, then clearly it, it may not be necessary to do this kind of planning. So it, it's not a one-size-fits-all uh, approach that we're recommending. We're I think this is really an approach that would be appropriate for places where you've got a long-term commitment to a place or a species, and it's really critical that you understand what might happen in 20, 30 years.
any other says thank you yeah <clears throat> yeah any other questions or any comments um maybe we should ask you all a question which is do you could you see yourselves using this does it look you know feasible to to use or are you feeling like ah this is overwhelming this is a lot of additional work they could have both of those emotions at the same time right <laughs> yes they could be feeling both both of those at the same time that's true <laughs> Can you can you read me Anita's question there? Um, would be an idea for the guidance to have a set of questions for planners to answer to see if they should use it. Yes. yes. Yeah, that's a very good idea. We're thinking of doing sort of a um, what it yeah what do you call those diagram. um, diagrams where flow diagrams where if this then if if yes then go this way if no then go that way. Yeah, it's yeah. a good suggestion, Anita. I was just sketching something like that out this afternoon. Yep, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Same way. It it hasn't made it into the into the presentation quite yet. Um, and Estrada says he would like to try it if he has the opportunity to do so. And I know we were going through um, all of this material pretty quickly, so you guys may be feeling kind of overwhelmed. Um, that is really the purpose of these uh, subsequent webinars. You know, we have three more of them. Um, is to view ten more digestible. Uh, you know, spend more time on on each component, basically. Yeah. And for those of you who are uh, are willing or able or or feel like you need to try it out, um, Marsha and I would be happy to help you and support you in, in thinking about, okay, at this point, what would you want to do? And uh, maybe yeah. it's just helping with Climate Wizard or just giving you advice. We're happy to, to help to field test this. Yeah, that would actually be of, of uh, great help to us. And I should say that okay. I have tried portions of this in, in uh, small villages in, in Kyrgyzstan. So there, it does have some field testing behind it. Yep. All right, I guess we're done. Okay. Um, yeah, it looks like we're done. No other comments or questions? Okay, well, we're done 15 minutes early then. Excellent. All right. Well, thank, thank you guys for your participation. Thank, thank you. Bye bye. All right. Bye. Bye. Talk tomorrow, Marsha. Okay.